Welcome to the City Business Festival 2023 series of conversations on radio and television on the Making It Ghana agenda. The City Business Festival this year is based on four sub themes the digital economy, SMEs, retail and consumer markets, and agri and agri business. For this morning, we'll be setting the scene for week one with understanding the digital economy. My guest is currently the Chief Executive Officer of TechGov Ghana Limited, and he's been doing this since 2020, but he's been working in various capacities within the digital space for over 25 years. He's a proven, trusted professional who advises and interacts with CEOs, business leaders, and government officials on a wide variety of topics. He is also passionate about African companies doing well on the global stage, and he's very happy to speak to us as the first guest on the Business Festival. Franklin, good to have you. Good to have you, Bernard. I just remember that I think a couple of years ago, we had an interview on the 12 pillars of the digital economy. And as I, I look through your book that you co-authored, Professor Kwiku Apia, I do, I see that a lot of work has gone in and you've built on that foundation. So let's talk about the transition from that interview to this book, for starters. Well, we've been talking about the digital economy for a long time. Mm. With you in particular, Bernard, so we share all the accolades we are having for an excellent book with you as well. Uh, we started talking about the pillars of the digital economy in terms of the different things, and I don't want to go back there, but we talked about globalization, uh, we talked about presumption, we talked about convergence, in trying to understand the digital economy. This book, uh, which is the latest book we have on the enabling architecture of the digital economy, is actually how you build one. So we have developed the thoughts from 2018 when we started having these discussions with you, Bernard. This is where we are today. Wonderful. So maybe let's define the digital economy again before we go into the... I think the book sets out a nice framework for us because mm -hmm. in building the architecture or the, or the enabling architecture of our economy, you and your, your co-author built it in eight big themes. That's correct. But when we say the digital economy, what are we talking about? Right. The digital economy is the new economy. Okay. It is an economy that produces digital goods and services using technology tools to facilitate those goods and services. It is the new economy. By that, we mean that we are going to compete for new services. And this is the time for the African and the Ghanaian in particular to wake up because it's a great opportunity to own businesses. And in terms of business models that are coming up, it is also a wonderful opportunity to transform some of the things that have gone on in the old in terms of doing things better in the new entities that we are setting up under the digital economy. The digital economy gives you the capacity to create new businesses and new business models. And as you know, in particular with the youth, because there will be a lot of self-employment in the ability to use those tools. And when we talk about those tools, we are talking about cloud, we're talking about social, we're talking about AI, we're talking about Internet of Things. These are the tools. And of course, the web. Amazing. Now, in the architecture discussion, mm -hmm. you start with digital skills, which you've said is like, very important because without the skills, you can't partake in the economy. Can you give us some insights into what digital skills are and why they are important in building the digital uh, economy's architecture? Very important. When we talk about digital, and that we've, talking, we've been talking about this for five years, the education we have in this country is skewed towards a lot of knowledge. In the digital era, well, the education that we have is skewed towards a lot of knowledge for industry. Mm -hmm. I uh, finished uh, Pope John 1982 from 5. Wow. I can still quote Archimedes principle. <laughs> the abstract on an object mm. immersed in a liquid mm. is equal to the weight of liquid that it displaces. Wow. June 1982. <laughs> but that was for the industrial era. Mm. The education that we require now mm. is the education of the digital and the tools of the digital. Mm -hmm. And we need to include that in our education. And I have already pushed that certain universities actually teach the digital skills, not just the coding, even in the ability to use the tools. Mm. If you meet the people who are very averse in using WhatsApp, there are things they can do with WhatsApp that you and I don't use. Mm -hmm. 
And I believe we have to actually teach it and teach it properly. Mm. Facebook, in mm-hmm. terms of Facebook, is a social marketing platform. That's mm-hmm. what it is. How do you use it to promote your business? That's education by itself. And I believe that if it is done and done properly in this age that we live in called the digital era, we'll be able to use the tools well and be able to leverage it to be able to create new business models and new businesses out of it to very much help the African to be able to break through, so to speak. You mentioned that COVID-19 further exacerbated the need to acquire digital skills. Absolutely. Because of the way the world became. Absolutely. And then you listed some basic skills like computer literacy. Yes. Email usage, yes. Web research, yes. These things seem very obvious, but it's there are still a lot of people who work who don't know these things. I I think that uh, well, allow me to say I think that COVID nineteen uh, in a roundabout way was a blessing because it was a wake up call. It means now that you need to be able to work comfortably from home. So if you are a professional, you need to be able to have all the tools to be able to work from home. You need to know how to use your email well, you know, your email tools well. Your Zoom, your MS Teams, very, very well now, you need to be able to share a file. And I know that is a problem for many. And this kind of, and and I think there's some workshops, maybe two, three hours, and that opens up business opportunities for people to get into that space. How soon within a child's education should digital skills be incorporated? Six, six years. Six years? Yeah, because these uh, these kids can already play games. Mm. The brain is properly wired. The kind of understanding they have of these games. But I believe that some of our kids are actually the ones who are showing the dads how to use anyway. So they are not so bad. <laughs> but in this generation that we find ourselves, I think that the development has to be done mm. uh, to make sure that... And I believe that the university should all have it and you should not be allowed to graduate uh, without a module on digital skills in some shape or form. I notice you add things like online transactions. Yes, to, payment to be, platforms. You need to know how to use those. Yes, because payments have all... I mean, the traditional payments, you know, writing checks. Uh, I haven't written a check for a long time. Uh, you, you should be able to make your payments using payment platforms. And uh, I think as an advantage, there are several Ghanaian companies who are developing these platforms. And we should encourage them and patronize in their use. Mm. We're talking to Franklin Asari, co-author of The Enabling Architecture for a Digital Economy. He's the CEO of Tech Gulf, And we're talking about the digital economy, basic understanding of it. So the first stage in building it is to acquire the skills. But that's just one side. What's the second thing that you need to think about? Storage. Storage. Because data is the new oil. Mm. And where you store the data matters. Mm-hmm. Because the ability to leverage the data stored Mm -hmm. can create several businesses. Mm -hmm. So if we store the Ghanaian data, say, in a country somewhere, and we want to mine that data, the opportunities that accrue to us and ability to mine that data would be for those countries who have the access to that data. I'm trying not to mention names, but Mm -hmm. I guess you see where I'm going. Mm -hmm. If we put our data on our own data platforms... We can create businesses to mine those, uh, the data that we place on those platforms. And Bernard, that's my greatest concern because we cannot see the opportunities that are available in putting data on our own platforms. I'm talking about cloud platforms. Mm. They should be Ghanaian cloud platforms. I, I was reading a book which suggested that the big four, in this case, Amazon, Google, Apple, and I think Microsoft, mm. They were, they are, they're all platform-based, but one of the key things is about the storage capacities of these organizations. Yes. That's what makes them strong. Amazon in particular, so yes. that they, are, they have massive terabytes of space that they use to do all the kinds of things they do. So people don't see storage as a, a, a resource, but it appears it's actually a bigger resource than even some of the minerals you have in your country. Absolutely. And uh, I, would, I want to extend the thought of storage to land. In the digital world, if you have storage... Then you have land. Mm. Mm-hmm. Because your ability to grow and develop depends on your land in the industrial era. In the digital era, it's your platform for storage. Wow. And the ability to mine that platform for information and decision making. That's what makes you powerful. It's funny because in economics, you are told there are four f- factors of production land, labor, capital, and enterprise. That's correct. So in the digital economy, 
the land is the storage. Absolutely. The labor then becomes the skill. Absolutely. And then, of course, investment is investment. That's uh, that capital. Is, that is correct. It doesn't change. That is and correct. And an enterprise is enterprise. That's that, what it is. That is correct. I've never thought about yeah. it like that. That is correct. So your ability to have land called storage in the literature is very, very powerful and very, very important. But this is a business opportunity. When we start saving our storage on our own storage platforms, we can now invite the Amazons of life, the Googles of life, to come into that space in partnership with us, where the partnerships are with Ghanaian companies, and we break out and we do very well out of it. At the moment, we are not creating these opportunities. They have all the data, and they are mining the data, and the data has been sold back to us. There should be synergies, there should be MOUs, there should be partnerships, there should be collaborations with Africans at this time. And this is not on just an individual or corporate level. We're talking about national level. Absolutely. Bernard, when the industrial era came, I was not born, I believe. Mm. Mm. But this is the time for the paradigm to change. Mm. Because we've moved from the industrial era to the digital era. And the millionaires of this age will be digital millionaires. If you look at the first 10 billionaires in the U.S. Just go and check. IT. There's actually a very interesting one. When you take the top companies in the world 30 years ago and you, you come to the top companies in the world today, in 30 years ago, they were all, probably 40 years ago, they were all in manufacturing. Yes. They were large FMCGs or yes. oil companies exploiting yes. natural resources. Now you have companies that are just platform companies, Amazon, Google, Apple, Apple. Microsoft, you know, Alibaba. Correct. They, they, all these companies, you even know where they physically are, but these guys are now the big, the big movers. So I think you're right there. Mm-hmm. Now, I need to say that the eight um, dimensions we're discussing on the digital economy is actually something developed by uh, Franklin and his co-author, Professor Apia Edu. It's called the eight-layer architecture for a digital economy. So this is actually something they developed. Absolutely. And, and this is something Novell even globally and particularly for the sub-Saharan African continent. That's correct. Because if you, if you check around the literature, you didn't see a lot of this type of things here. So skills as a base. Yes. Storage is the next level. Right. After that, where do you go? Connectivity. Connectivity. The ability to connect bandwidth into the storage, almost like a lens, to be able to see into it. The cost of that transmission is connectivity. That cost has to come down in a digital economy so that the development of services can be done at, a, at an appropriate or good or competitive rate internationally. Mm-hmm. So at the moment we have uh, data services available, we need to look at other sources as well. In partner development partners, data has to be everywhere. And if you go to the West now, go to UK in particular, the US, data is available everywhere. You can get into a bus, <laughs> for example, and the data will be free in terms of Wi-Fi. Uh, it's not so freely available now because of the cost. So we will also have to get there. What are your thoughts around the best ways of bringing costs down? I know some of the telcos are doing fiber. I know Elon Musk is doing satellite everywhere, which is funny because satellite initially was the technology. Yes. And then we did fiber, which we thought was much, much higher, but he is now put so many satellites back in the air. That's right. And then if you look at the map, Africa is not that much covered, but globally he's, he's doing very well and the costs are coming right. down. How should African countries think about the connectivity question? Because as you say, costs are still high right. and the bandwidth are very low. In fact, if you're doing a Zoom conference mm-hmm. and people are connecting from everywhere in the world, you will know they are in Africa when the internet connectivity is that poor Absolutely. because they have to do audio because mm-hmm. the video then slows their thing down. Mm-hmm. Any ideas around how to improve connectivity and reduce the cost? Because that, that's the main bottleneck, isn't it? I do. I just uh, make you laugh a little bit. I mm-hmm. think that somebody like Elon Musk should be made in Koswane in my village. Uh, uh, Elon Musk should be made in Koswane in one of the villages in Ghana. We need to have a collaboration with Starlink. And I think as a country, in terms of policy direction, we can share our digital strategy with him and ask so that he can play in the satellite space. And uh, whether we like it or not, Elon Musk is an African. He comes from South Africa. I think we can have that conversation. It's just reaching out to him. I know he's working in Nigeria. I know he's working in Kenya right now. I'm not sure he's working in Ghana. I think it's a good time to sit down with him. You, you think that the solutions he professes, particularly within the connectivity space, Will, could be the key to unlocking this, 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 this mind. That is correct. And 
And the caveat for that discussion or the trigger or the enabler for that discussion is that he's into electric cars. Mm. This whole thing about connectivity, if we don't get it right, we are not going to leverage the area where electric cars have been developed. Because the electric car can pick up where it is, the next pizza joint, <clears throat> the next fuel joint, the next fuel place where they can get fuel, etc. So you need a lot of bandwidth to be able to do that. So for those conversations, you need, you need a big partner. Wonderful. This is the City Business Festival on air series on radio. Our first episode, we're talking the digital economy. My guest is Franklin Asari, CEO of Tech Gulf, who is a co-author of the latest book on the digital economy, co-authored with Kweku Apia Edu, The Enabling Architecture for a Digital Economy. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we will get into the other layers. We'll talk about things like integration, databases, application, and all of that flowing into business intelligence. Stay with us. Welcome back to the City Business Festival, our online series on radio. Week one, we're focusing on the digital economy. My guest for today is Franklin Nassari, CEO of Tech Golf. You haven't even told me what Tech Golf is, by the way. Wow. Well, Tech Golf is a technology company. Okay. We want to build, to bridge the digital divide between Africa and the U.S. And oh. that's where the name really, Golf, uh, Golf okay. comes from. Um, we are writing our own future in terms of that digital journey. Tech Golf is in the storage space. Okay. And that's where we are now. We also want to be in other spaces as we grow and develop. But, but I've noticed that this is not just for Franklin Nassari and for Tech Golf. I think the business opportunities that are opened are huge. And this is a time for collaboration. This is a time for people to take the other layers up and, and do them and, and create business models out of them and go out there and win. Mm. Wonderful. Let's come back to the model you created. Mm. The skills, storage, connectivity. Your next layer there is integration. Correct. Reminds me of a subject in secondary school, differentiation integration. Yes. It took me a while to get it, but eventually I did. I'm not sure it's the same thing you're talking about. We're talking about IT integration, and in that regard, we've done quite a bit here in terms of interoperability, all these payment platforms, but there's still a lot more to do. Now, in that, in that layer alone, there are a lot of business opportunities. Setting up of payment platforms, one of them, the management of some of these payment platforms, and making sure that they are compliant, etc. I'm talking about business models already coming out of that particular layer. But the point about integration is that they need to be able to talk to each other. Mm. Because we have a lot, I'll get to database in the next level, but mm. because the integration layer doesn't allow us to talk, mm. it limits our ability to use the tools at the top, which are the databases. So, for example, on a national level, let's just say you have DVLA. Yeah. You have um, passports. Yeah. You have um, taxes yeah. like uh, GRE. Yeah. You have uh, digital address. Yeah. Is integration the ability to say having all these agencies speak to each other? That is correct. Is that and much deeper. If you want to go and apply for a DVLA license, mm -hmm. they w they should be able to use your passport passport photo. In your license application without having you to go and take another photo. Wow. So your health card, for example. So you are the one and same person. So your Ghana card, that kind of thing. Absolutely. So you are integrating different sets of data so you can minimize cost and also be more efficient. That is correct. Amazing. That is correct. Mm. So that is a level we haven't reached. And therefore, it makes it very difficult because all of these platforms that we have now, Bernadia, are discrete. Mm they need to be brought together with this layer so that they can talk to each other. And in their talking to each other is where we get the most value out of them. Mm. And who's supposed to lead that integration? I think there has to be clearly a policy direction. Mm. Um, and when the policy direction is in place, I think it will open up several companies, IT companies, to, to develop these platforms to allow the different areas to be able to talk to each other. Huge opportunity for business. And it's maintenance. Let's talk about databases because you can't discuss integration without discussing databases. Absolutely. So what do you mean by databases and why is that so critical in this, your, mm. your model? 
Well, I come from Oracle, so certainly I have a passion for databases. A database is almost like an IT cluster mm-hmm. that allows you to... This is uh, the, refined, uh, the revised standard version from Asari. <laughs> that allows you to capture information mm. and to be able to group that information by indexing that information. So you can have a database of people. You can have them into gender male and female, you can have them into age brackets. Now, that database, via the integration layer, via the connectivity layer, points to storage. I'm looking down now. The databases need to be managed well. In the way we capture, in the way, and I'll talk about cybersecurity later, in the way we protect it, Mm. in the way we formalize a certain level of consistency in what we capture. Mm. I would say that if you look at several databases, I'm sure in Ghana, the way they are captured is different. There must be a certain level of consistency, all laid down by policy. First name, last name, last name, first name. And how the databases are used from a regulatory perspective, one of them, but also from a health check perspective. For example... In the UK, if you're dead, you're dead. Because they will pick you up. Mm -hmm. I think in Ghana, you can die for a while. Nobody knows. uh, The system will still be paying your... Absolutely. Your your social security. (laughs) Absolutely. And and other things. Absolutely. And that's what we need a little bit more of integrity Mm. at the database level. Because that is where we categorize all the information that we have captured. So see the database as an opportunity to categorize that information. And to be able to say that this data is relevant, this data is dormant, mm. all those parameters and protocols are set up at that, at that level. And therefore, you need some logic in doing that. Have I been too technical? No, no, you're not. But you seem to be talking at a very high level in terms of policy national. So let's assume I'm listening and I run a shoe factory. Yeah. Or I sell spare parts. Mm-hmm. Why on earth should I be interested in digital skills, storage, connectivity? integration database. It sounds like Charlie Brofusem. I, I understand. understand. <laughs> but I think that there are several levels in our business environment that we need to guide and lead and handhold and I respect that. But I certainly think that if the same uh, spare parts person, for example, you should be aware that the generation of children that they have will be in the digital era and prepare them. And for the, for him or for this father or for this mother realize that their kids in addition will also have to have digital skills and develop them. But it is possible that these warehouses in Abuso, Kain, and other places can have a database of the parts that they have without having to go there and look for whether you have a small part for my car or not and being able to search it online and see what is available. So you can see behind the computer and know exactly where what you're looking for is. Absolutely. Call for it instead of going to rummage through. Absolutely. And this is a business opportunity now for somebody. And if somebody wants to do it, they should come and speak to you and we can talk about it. So your, your point is that these, these things have applications even for the normal businesses we do. It's not esoteric. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Interesting. So that's databases. And then at the top of the layer is applications. What are applications and why is applications at the top? An application... It's a tool that allows you to leverage and use the information in a database. That's all it is. And I'm saying that in terms of building applications, we have big companies that have come out of the U.S. in doing that. I want to see in my lifetime local companies, young men and women, develop applications to be able to leverage the data in our databases to make sense for business use. So when I say applications, it could be as simple as finding out the market price of tomatoes in a certain market, uh, Bogos or wherever, there's a big market, and making that information available for the market queens to be able to use so they don't have to travel to find out they don't have the stock they're looking for. As basic as that. It's an application. Mm. It could be an ERP that allows them to capture their transactions. Because you find out in the world of ERPs, the big boys at the top charge so much. We have very few players at the bottom Mm. because most companies in Ghana, Bernada, are small companies. They don't even have $250,000 in terms of revenue. 
they should not necessarily be using the kind of applications for companies that we work for for many years. There should be something very simple to allow their businesses to grow. You'll find that there are so many businesses in a part of the world that are not growing because they don't have the decision-making tools that will help them to grow. These are applications. These should be built by men, young men and women, and the revenue should stay here. So in the next five to seven years, I want to see a young man build an ERP that can be used in Ghana for our small, small businesses. You still keep using technical terms. What is ERP? An ERP is a, a pla- it's an accounting platform, enterprise resource planning platform, allowing you to manage your books. Most companies in our part of the world, they use Excel for their books, if at all. You should be able to capture revenue in a decent manner. You should be able to capture your costs in a decent manner. You should be able to procure and procure right. We have to move away from our paperwork. That's why somebody spends 40 years in doing a business and they want to retire. They cannot sell it. They have nothing to show for it. So there's no system of tracking the revenues. There's no way of knowing if they have done their statutories properly. And therefore, even though we can see the building and we can see that the man has money, we don't really know intrinsically the cash flow. Absolutely. And it has a great impact on inheritance in a part of the world because you don't see third, fourth level generation wealth in a part of the world because the ERPs to capture those transactions are I really not there that people can work on. I mean, if you go to the West, they have been using systems for a very long time. And you, because your ability to sell the company is about the systems that your company has and the people that they employ. And you cannot put a price on the people alone. Your transactions in terms of your due diligence required to sell it. By the way, I'm an accountant. Let me stop there. It's based on your ability to make sure that your transactions are done right. So for me, I think that we should be able to do ERPs and do ERPs right. But the capacity to create those ERPs are here. I get a sense that a lot of the applications that we get used to are communication applications and applications for entertainment type things for maybe, of course, for payments as well. Mm. We haven't really got into the applications that improve productivity that is of the company that is and correct. of the individual. Is that a, a reflection of just the lack of application-making abilities, the lack of demand? Because what you're saying sounds very logical, but most of the apps people will use are, yeah, let me pay my water bill. Yeah, maybe let me go and mm. pay for my DSTV. That's the payment platforms. Yeah, right. but we're talking about applications that can also help your company manage its systems plan better. Plan your resources. That doesn't mm-hmm. seem to be the preoccupation of many people at this time. And it should be. And I think that uh, the onus is on us to preach it almost like the good news, the gospel, and push it out there. Because I think that to one extent it's a lack of knowledge. The other extent is the maturity of the economies that we are in. And if these economies are, are to grow industrial or digital for that matter, these applications need to be in place. And they don't have to be the big applications for some companies that we ask we some kind of work for. They can be very small applications allowing you to plan your life. Most people cannot tell you how much they're spending. Mm. Yes, in our part of the world. That's a problem. Um, let's, let's bring it home. At the top of the diagram is business intelligence. And then on the side, you've put cybersecurity. What are you trying to say? Right. Business intelligence is almost like the layer that allows you to look at the information almost like a dashboard and use it for decision making. So all the way from your storage, coming up through your connectivity, Mm. all the way coming up in your databases and your applications, this is where you get to use the information. You've been waiting for this for a very long time. This is where you make sound decisions as a leader. Mm. And your leadership will be born out of your ability to make decisions. This is the fruit or the icing on the cake as you follow all the levels up to business intelligence. But today, Bernard, we are talking about business intelligence enabled by AI. So the paradigm shifts. Artificial intelligence having the ability to integrate the data for you in a much deeper and more intimate manner for you to use. If the African, and the Ghanaian for that matter, doesn't get it right at this level, third world will even be a loose term for us. We'll be behind. Very, very. So whereas AI can help us to leapfrog and catch up if we, if we don't get into this space now, the gap could, bring, could, be, could be much much bigger. Yes, sir. Wow. Mm. And then uh, sort, of, sort of tying all of this guy is cybersecurity. Just a quick comment on that before we then wrap up. What, what do you mean by cybersecurity? Cybersecurity is almost like the policeman at each of the levels. Mm. Making sure that, for example, that your database is secure. Mm-hmm. Your application cannot be hacked in. Your integration layer, nobody has access and it is tight. 
all this knowledge or businesses can be developed alongside the seven layers, the data and the cybersecurity being the eighth one. What I'm trying to do in the book and in this session and the other opportunities that will open up is for people to begin to see opportunities that will allow us to welcome the digital era. For some people, they, haven't, they don't even know what it is. Because if you have an industrial business now, whether you like it or not, we've moved to the digital era, and that is what is beginning. Cybersecurity means you need to learn a lot in terms of how databases work, how applications work, and the security protocols behind them. And that also is included within the skills layer in terms of knowledge and training that is required. Mm. Mm. Wonderful. In conclusion, what, where do you see Ghana? What do we need to do finally as a country to be at the forefront of this opportunity that digital economy presents? Policy mm. in the direction of data sovereignty, data privacy, things like that, very, very important. I think that is required. I think workshops to be done. Um, I think companies need to also look at this in terms of their strategy and how they expect their companies to leapfrog because things have changed. I expect in the level of politics, somebody will be employed directly with the digital economy in view and how we can make sure that the government, because it's a whole whole project that needs to happen at the government level across all ministries. I'm not saying it's not happening. I'm just saying that it has to be done in a more aggressive manner. But let me speak to companies. I think if you're a company in Ghana and you want a legacy and you want to leave something behind, you either embrace the digital economy now or forget it because this world is moving at a very fast pace. Wonderful. We've been speaking to Franklin Asari, who is the CEO of Tech Golf Limited. And Franklin has been working in the technology space for, I don't know, 30, 25 to 30 years. His latest work is a book he co-authored with Professor Kwiku Apiaedu titled The Enabling Architecture for a Digital Economy, which has really been the basis for this week's conversation. In the coming days, you'll be hearing more about payment systems, the e-business environment, financing, and all of that. And we hope you have a good time with us throughout the week. Thank you, Franklin, for being on the program. Thank you.